Hey everybody. Today we're introducing statistical sampling. So in a perfect world, when we conduct a research study, we would be able to collect data from the entire population of interest. We'd be able to conduct a census. In practice though, data like that is not possible to collect, or at least isn't practical to collect. For instance, consider these research questions. What's the average lifespan of pigeons in New York? Is a new medication effective in reducing LDL cholesterol in patients over 45? What percentage of voters approve of the way the President of the United States is doing their job? In each case, getting data on the entire population just isn't in the cards. So instead, we look at a subset of the population. That is, we collect a sample. There are many ways to do that, and some are better than others. Here's a couple of the wrong ways to do it. You should be skeptical of anecdotal evidence, which just consists of personal testimonials from individuals that the researcher happens to be acquainted with. For instance, this pill worked for my whole family, or I talked to three people today who approve of the president. Closely related is the idea of a convenience sample, where data is collected just because it's easily accessible. For instance, a political poll taken outside in a nearby park or a psychological study whose, student, whose subjects are the professor's students. This latter is particularly common, actually. In each case, the sample is likely to be different from the population in important ways, which has the potential to introduce bias into the study, that is, a systematic skewing of the results in one direction or another. For instance, college students may react very differently in a psychological study than older individuals or individuals that are not in college more generally. A random sample is one in which a random process is used to determine which members of the population are included in the sample. Typically, all members of the population have an equal chance of being selected. The point of the random sample is to avoid sampling bias, in which your statistic is likely to be systematically higher or lower than the parameter you're trying to estimate, on average. One warning here. Statistics derived from random samples are still variable. Individual samples are likely to be different from the population as a whole just due to the random process. This is not a form of bias. On average, that statistic will still equal the parameter. There are many sorts of different random samples. Let's talk about a few of them. A simple random sample, or SRS, is the most intuitive. It's one in which every sample of the same size has an equal chance of being selected. Typically, the way this is done is by getting a list of the members of the population, numbering them all, and then using a random number generator to pick out the desired number of them. In a stratified sample, the population is first divided into groups, strata, according to some important characteristic like age, sex, or race. And then a simple random sample is taken from each group. The point here is that in a stratified random sample, you're able to get information about those different groups separately, and not just the population as a whole. In a cluster sample, the population is also divided into groups. This time, however, the groups tend to be similar, sometimes naturally occurring ones. And then a simple random sample of clusters is taken, so the randomization takes place at the cluster level. And then every member of the selected clusters is included in the sample. A multi-stage sample combines these techniques. First, we select some clusters, and then we take random samples from each. And that process can be repeated several times if necessary. Let's do some examples. Um, in each of the four problems, we want to identify the sampling method that's being used. A pollster contacts 400 men and 400 women at random, asking each whom they support in an upcoming election. This is a typical example of a stratified sample. We're gathering information on both men and women and taking a simple random sample among each group. Number two, researchers select 50 high schools at random, then give a math proficiency exam to every student at those schools. This is an example of a cluster sample. The randomization has taken place between the groups, and then once we've selected those groups, we've done a census within each one of the selected groups. Example three, a car dealership uses a customer list to randomly select 200 previous car buyers. They then contact each one with a satisfaction survey. This is a prototypical example of a simple random sample. 
every group of 200 customers has the same chance of being selected. Number four, a medical group randomly chooses 35 U.S. hospitals. They then take um, a random sample of 50 patients in each, examining the cost of their care. This is a multi-stage sample. We started with clusters, the hospitals in the U.S., selected some at random, and then did a sample, simple random sample within each one. One final method of sampling that we want to mention that's not a sort of random sample, but sometimes is used as a stand-in. That's the systematic sample. With a systematic sample, members of the population are chosen in some predetermined way. For instance, a grocery store could study customer satisfaction by surveying every 20th person to exit their store. A systematic sample can be just as effective as a random sample if the population is homogeneous, that is, if there aren't any relevant patterns in it. However, if the population does have patterns, you would have to be careful that your system for selecting the, the people that are going to be in the sample um, doesn't pick up any of those patterns and therefore give you bias.